Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show on which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. We're thrilled to have you here with us today. We've got another great guest. Before I get to the guest, I want to tell you about something. We have this great community called the Typology Institute Membership. Every month for our members, we have a special podcast, a newsletter, and my very favorite thing, which is called a town hall, where we get together with all of the members online. We talk about the Typology Institute membership podcast. We talk about the Typology podcast. The conversation goes all kinds of places. It's super fun. There's lots of dialogue. Ian answers all your questions. Super, super fun. Make sure you check that out. It's $15 a month or $150 for the whole year. And it's a really, really cool experience. And we're doing more stuff with that all the time. To learn more, just simply go to typologyinstitute.com. That's T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y institute.com. Okay, now let me get to our guests. Again, all this month, we're talking about how to feed your brain. As part of this series we have with us today, and you've been asking for her, Dr. Caroline Leaf, PhD, neuroscientist, mental health and mind expert, best-selling author, top health podcast host, communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist. She hosts the podcast, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. You've been asking for her, and today we do a deep dive with Dr. Caroline Leaf. So happy that you're here. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now, without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Crumb. Hello, Typology Tribe. Welcome to this very exciting episode I have with us today. Communication pathologist, cognitive neuroscientist, podcaster, author of several books, including Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, Five Simple Scientifically Proven Steps to Reduce Anxiety, Stress, and Toxic Thinking. And she's so much more. Please welcome Dr. Caroline Leaf. Welcome, Caroline. Oh, well, thank you so much, and it's great to be with you. Let's start off by just asking you a 50,000 foot question. Just tell us about yourself, your work, and perhaps your life's mission. Well, I've been obsessed with the mind and the brain since I can remember. And I was actually going into um, neurosurgery. And then I thought, well, I can't learn about the mind if I'm dealing with people that are asleep. So I was very fortunate to actually have the opportunity to do a degree back in South Africa that was not, it was a new, it was almost like an experimental degree um, where they blended medicine and psychotherapy, uh, sorry, psychology, linguistics, communication, pathology, um, and neuroscience. And it was a lot of, it was fantastic. A lot of clinical work, we did grand rounds in the hospital. And it was fantastic to a point where I, we were all pretty exhausted because we were working seven days a week because it was a seven year degree that they put into four years. And it was experimental and they basically changed it after four, after 60 of us, only 60 of us in the world have qualified with this degree because it was just too taxing and they changed it back to being two different degrees after that. Now I say all this to say that there was a point in the midst of my degree where I thought, oh my gosh, why am I doing this to myself? It was it was really the hours we worked, the clinical work we did was just unbelievably taxing. But now, as soon as I've, you know, looking back all these years and once I had finished the degree, I realized that that exposed me to a way of thinking that I would not have had if I had gone straight into pure medicine yeah. or mm -hmm. just gone into, you know, one of the other fields because it was kind of a blend of three fields. And so I'm very grateful for that experience. And it really drove me into doing further research in, at, at, at different levels and eventually landing up doing, I still do research. I've been researching for 38 years now, I still do clinical trials. We've got three big trials on at the moment. And I'm driven by the, just helping people to understand how the mind and the brain connect and just the understanding what is the mind, what is the brain, what's the relationship, what level of, um, of control do we actually have? You know, what is neuroplasticity? All these questions, what are thoughts? And, you know, how many thoughts do we think in a day? And, and you know, what do we do with all these things? And how can we, you know, so those questions have driven me and I've practiced clinically for 25 years. And that gave me a tremendous amount of experience. And parallel to that, I was very privileged to be, to grow up in South Africa. I was born in Zimbabwe and very privileged to work in the, um, in, in the areas that were very damaged by the apartheid system. And when I say privileged, I learned everything, I th honestly think just about everything that I know about human potential and human resilience, I learned 
from the most incredible people. Um, in South Africa at that stage, that terrible, terrible system, as we're all aware, I worked in the in the apartheid era, in the transition with Mandela, and then the post-apartheid era, and it was unbelievable seeing the damage that was done to people mm. emotionally and educationally, and and I and I was really privileged to go and work in those areas and try and make some good out of the terrible things that had happened. And I worked in schools and communities and I would teach them about their mind and their brain and how to learn, a lot of how to learn in the education side and a lot of stuff on dealing with emotional trauma. I could drive anywhere, nine months pregnant, and no one would touch me. And I say that to say that in that in that time back in South Africa, if you were white and you were a woman, you you would not have survived five minutes in the areas that I worked. But because of the message, and, I, and, and that's why I'm telling you this, because of the message that I brought, which was one of hope, which was one of, hey, listen, I want to learn from you as much as I can give you. I can tell you about your mind, your brain. I can help you learn. I can help you get educated. I can help you, you know, st- just try to manage your emotions and so on. It was a message that was real, well received. I'd go into a school and there would be – long drop toilets. I don't know if you know what those are, but like no toilets, no facilities, no, like one textbook amongst a hundred kids. I mean, it was just unreal. And there would be thousands of people that would turn up. Now we had no microphones, but they would sit out there. The communities would just come and just, I mean, wherever you looked, there were people and somehow they heard me. And it was honestly 25 years, three days a week of, of most incredibly incredible experience. I also worked in Rwanda of genocide. Um, you know, so these are things that have, have continued to motivate me to really help people understand the human resilience and the power. I hate to say the power of the mind because it's really been overused that too. Understand that it is okay to be a mess and it's okay to have depression and anxiety and frustration and and life really can get you down and it's ex- at the same time it's excitement and joy all the other sides emotions are not illnesses emotions are these beautiful things that we can experience and, and grow in resilience and we are a lot more resilient than what we realize that's another huge part of the work that i have done so that's where I sit today. Now, don't, I don't practice anymore. I just write lots of books, written lots of books, do research. I have app, uh, an app as well where I have tried to take the system, uh, not tried, I've taken the system that I've developed on directed neuroplasticity and put this into a system within which, I mean, you can put psychotherapy techniques, CBT, you can put any techniques you want into it. It's pretty much just the system of how we can get the mind to drive the brain. And so I'm constantly refining that process and helping people, helping mental health to be more accessible to everyone. Mm. Can you describe briefly um, what the difference is between the mind and the brain? Because I don't think, I think people just sort of see them as synonymous. Um, is there a way to do that? Uh, give, a, oh, give, yes. us a, give us a precis? Yes, I can. So he has a brain and we definitely not, this is not who we are. Okay. So this is just part of what we are. So the quickest and easiest way to understand the mind brain difference is to think of the fact that right now we are having a conversation. We can listen to each other. We can communicate, we can see each other. um, And if we were dead, we couldn't do that. So the difference between you and I now having this conversation and the listeners and the viewers and a dead person is our mind. Our mind is this integral life giving energetic force that enables us to experience being human and from a certain point in the womb to the age you have now every single experience that you have is being built into the brain coded into the brain so the brain is constantly changing because the mind is constantly changing and also into every cell of the body because our brain and body are the physical part of us and the mind is the thing that makes the brain and the body work so the brain and the body basically are physical substrates that if you die they're just going to disintegrate. But if you're alive, they are responding to what the mind is experiencing. So the mind shows up in the brain and the body. The brain and the body respond to the mind. And we can actually learn with our mind. So the mind is doing all the stuff to process um, and to drive this process. And just very, very quickly, think of a computer. If you think of just a computer that's just being built, it then needs to be charged. It needs a software developer to develop software to be able to put into the computer. And then it requires that you get an operating system. And then you get the computer and you have to actually make sure it's charged and you have to use the computer. All those functions make a computer usable. That is really another way of looking at the mind-brain difference. The brain being just this 
piece of hardware that's very complex way more complex than a computer but it is a piece of hardware that needs all the software and the energy and the plug it in and the person and all those factors to make it use and um, useful and that's pretty much you know another example of mind brain the mind brain difference you know the human person is um in my mind um so remarkably complex and at many levels mysterious, um, you know, in its in its way of our way of being in the world. And I know that you uh, and I, I use that as a segue um, to maybe jump into this topic, which is you I know self identify as a person of faith, a, a Christian, and I'm wondering how that how your faith and worldview kind of figure into your work and research. Right? Like, where's the intersection of those two things? I get asked this question a lot. I'd actually, you know, I'd rather call myself spiritual than because I do believe in that other faiths exist. I don't believe mm -hmm. there's only one faith. That for me is quite important to understand that there's it's such a huge, God is such a huge concept. Um, and so that's the one side. The other side is I don't see any difference between it. I have my most spiritual moments when I'm doing my research. Um, science and spirituality are two sides of the same coin. Where I often say the sort of the, the the if you look at it this way, the holy texts are basically telling us the philosophy and the story and the guidelines. You know the verbal guidelines of how we should be functioning as humans and the stories of disaster and and reconciliation and all that. But science is telling us how it all works, how you as a human work, how your brain works, how your body works, how the world works, how gravity works, how you know how. The computer works, how this technology works, all of that is the science. Is science. So I don't ever see a, a um, split between the two. And I mean, I've taught in churches around the world for years, and I've often had people say, ask me this question. It's definitely better now, but 25 years ago, it was, I was honestly in some places seen as a you know pariah. How can you say mm. science and spirituality are the same thing? Meanwhile, they are. So if you believe that God created the universe, if that's your belief system, then how the universe works is part of that. So therefore, science is science comes from the word sclera, which means knowledge. And knowledge is basically how the universe works. So I don't see any kind of split. I see it as a beautiful marriage between the two, two sides of the same coin. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. I, I completely agree. Now, what do you mean when you say our minds uh, are a mess? Because frankly, I can tell you, or at least my wife would tell you that my mind is, is like a yard sale. Um, you know, it is a, a mess. Um, what does that mean? I think everyone kind of knows that that's the truth. I don't think anybody would argue with it, right? But, but what do you mean that it's a mess and that it requires detoxing? Well, that's a, 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 the, I'm glad you've asked that question because it really is, it's a, a loaded question that brings tremendous, the answer is going to bring tremendous freedom to people. And it's been a huge part of my work. And that's why I actually now talk about this concept so much. Um, basically, your mind has different levels. And the one level is your conscious mind, which is easy to understand. It's when you're awake and it's this conscious stream and, and we process and so on and respond. Then you get the, the biggest part of us, however, is the non-conscious, N-O-N, not unconscious. People always talk about the unconscious. The unconscious mind is when you're asleep, anesthetized or knocked out with a baseball bat or something. So when we talk about mind, we don't talk about, shouldn't be talking about unconscious. We should be talking about non-conscious. That is the correct scientific term. And the non-conscious is absolutely fascinating, as is the rest of us. Within the depths of the non-conscious mind, we have a 24-hour incredibly intelligent, dynamic, self-regulatory, phenomenal process working with you and not against you. It's that inner wisdom. And if you want to get spiritual, it's pretty much your spirit and your soul level. And so the non-conscious mind you could literally put on that level of your spirit and soul. And then your conscious mind could be your conscious soul. So the non-conscious mind works 24 seven. It's driving everything. Every experience that you've ever had from a certain point in the womb to the age you act now, as I mentioned earlier, that is built into the non-conscious mind as gravitational fields, if we want to get physics-y, and in the brain as these as tree-like structures, clusters of, of details, which are memories that cluster into structures that look like a tree, and I'll hold a little 
prop up. I'm holding up a little bush in a little pot that looks like a little green bush. This is literally what our thoughts look like, a cluster of memories that are similar and associated and categorized together. And they cluster together and you can keep adding to them and you can take away and you can change. And that's the beauty of, of, the neuro, of neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the mind to change the brain. So essentially, the non-conscious mind is filled with all this, this experience. And what's super interesting is that 95 and probably more, around 95 to 97% of how we basically show up in the world, how we function, is driven by the non-conscious mind. And when I say about 95%, we're absorbing everything around us from that certain point in the womb to the age we're at now, your culture, your belief, your upbringing, the socioeconomic, the political, the things you do at university, what you read, who you speak to, who you spend time with, just by the nature of being human and the mind-brain-body interaction, your mind is processing life into your brain as these structures, also into every cell of your body. And we have 37 to 100 trillion cells in our brain and our body. So we make 37 to 100 trillion memories, literally of every single or thoughts mm. with their memories of every single experience. It's a lot. And then it's in the gravitational fields of our mind, which are basically boiled down to Einstein's work on the photoelectric effects and so on. So it's a lot of stuff that we are coding in non-consciously and some of that's not going to be great so some of it's going to be toxic so i hold up a toxic tree hopefully most of it's going to be fairly healthy but i mean just with what's going on around us now COVID, the war you know the, the everything that's happening the traumas that happen in life the there's a lot of this that happens too we also as a child you don't control everything that you're exposed to even as an adult you don't so 95 percent of what we are thinking about or being driven by is is non-conscious so our mind Non-conscious mind, which is our deep spiritual nature, has a wise part. And that wise part, wise mind, you know, it's, as a psychotherapist, you'd recognize that term. It's a commonly used term. I, I use the wise mind or your deep intuition is actually in a state of incredible power, powerfully, it's a, it has a love design. It's literally, or it's working for you and not against you. So it's a deep part of your mind that is on your side. And its job is to scour these forests of endless trees and find these and make you aware of these so that you can reconceptualize them. These are your stories of your life, your experiences. Now, you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's in you, which is pretty much the principle of, of mind, brain-driven neuroplasticity. So you don't want to get rid of your story. You want to change its impact. You want to edit the code. So this is the messy part of us. So if you think of a huge forest, the deep inner spiritual wise mind is that middle part of the forest that's perfect, untouched, and and just per perfection. And the outside is filled with a mixture of these of different sizes and some of these and hopefully more of these than those. And those are the that's kind of the messy part. In every moment we're messy. As we go through the day, we're messy. We because because we don't know what's coming up. We don't know exactly what the next conversation is going to hold, what the next answer to the questions are going to be, what the next question is. So you experiment. And that's fantastic. It's an absolute gift that we have as humans to think and feel and choose in this kind of messy way. But if we manage that, if we self-regulate that, then what we can look at is we can start editing the code. We can start noticing the conscious things that we've paid attention to that make up the other 5%. And we can start looking at the impact of that, that up to 95% that is, that is driving us, that we didn't really consciously, we weren't consciously aware of it building in. But we can regulate and edit that code, that neural code, by being aware of its impact. So... A large bulk of my work has been to help people to accept the messiness and then to learn to self-regulate the messiness. So to develop an awareness of, you know, what is it that, what are the signals, how are you showing up, and then tracking back down to directly to, you know, what is the thought behind it? Because you can't just say things and do things. Everything you say and do is coming from a thought. So if I'm acting, um, if I'm very... Um, frustrated, um, sad, um, think life sucks, have pain, a lot of pain in my body, and just are battling to be creative and connect with others. Let's say that that's the description. That's Those are signals, these four basic signals that are coming from a thought tree inside your brain and inside your body. 
in your psychic skeleton of your cells and in the gravitational fields of your mind. So in other words, everything you say and do and feel and your perspectives in life are not random events. They are as the result of a thought. And the thought doesn't just randomly get there. It got there from exposure of some sort that your mind processed on an unconscious level and or conscious level. And so there's a root, like we have a, it's tree, the tree-like structure. So this would be the source, the abuse, the impact of the war, the impact of COVID, you know, the, the details of COVID in your life. That is processed and that's your, this level is your interpretation, how you see yourself, how you're thinking, feeling and choosing about yourself and your life as a result of this. This obviously interrupts your identity, your global self-worth, your everything that plays out in relationships, how you function, et cetera, et cetera. So as a psychotherapist, this makes a lot of sense, I'm sure, because you understand you've got to get to the root of the issue. The thing with going to the root of the issue is that people get stuck at the root because they can't understand why. And there's a lot of, why did this happen to me? Why did they do that? We'll never understand the why. So part of um, of healing and of detoxing the mind and dealing with the mess is recognizing this is a mess. It produces a mess. It's okay to be messy. Let me embrace the messiness. Let me decipher and deconstruct and reconstruct the messiness so that I can learn how to accept and move forward and reconceptualize. So it's in a process of embracing, processing and reconceptualizing. So it's it, it, the difference between to managing managing a messy mind is giving yourself permission to feel it, to embrace it, but not to stay there. So there's a tremendous amount, as you'd be well aware, in in the current talk and language of of um, the, just psychology in the world and social media of you know be authentic, be aware. Awareness is so important. Meditation, aware, it is so important. But if you stop at awareness, you're going to create tremendous damage in the brain and the body because of neuroplasticity, because of the relationship. And that's and I've done research directly on this, which I actually put some of the this, um, the brain slides in my book, which you would have seen. But if, if we just when we just created awareness in our subjects of the of what issues they were going through, they got worse. The more aware they became without mind management, the worse they actually became. And this is what we see a lot of. Obviously, in my research, ethically, you have a point where you stop and then you give the treatment to the subjects. The treatment being the system I developed, not drugs, but a mind treatment, a mind-directed neuroplasticity treatment called the neurocycle was what we worked on. But essentially, we can't just be aware. We can't, we have, we can't, we've got to go beyond. We also can't just get stuck. When we're aware, it freaks us out. So people get into breathing and meditation, and that's fantastic. Calming down the neurophysiology. There's a lot of talk around the vagus nerve and calming the vagus, a little bit over, a little bit unscientific, some of that, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But breathing, meditation, calming down your neurophysiology is essential. So when we face stuff, we do have a physiological reaction because it's in our brain and our body. We're bringing it up. We will react. So we do need to calm that down so that we can become aware of what we're reacting to. But then we need to go beyond awareness and we need to start processing. And that requires a, a, you know, a process of you know reflecting and doing a whole lot of different things in a very systematic way. Because for your mind to manage the mess, we need to understand that the mind-brain connection is a very systematic, very organized, very logical, very mathematical process. In, inside every little branch, there are, if I take a little piece of a branch, it's made of thousands of proteins. Inside every protein um, is our, our little structures that basically hold vibrations. And those vibrations are energetic forces that are the content of what you are learning. So my words are becoming little vibrations inside proteins, building onto branches as, as I'm speaking more and more and more is being added. My words that I'm speaking and your questions are at this level, the root level, because the source of this discussion is our communication. This part would be the interpretation. So I'm holding up a little bushy tree. The root system would be the what you're hearing, and the branches above the ground would be your interpretation of what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. So that's a big tree. But what happens if it's really messy? You know, and if you've been abused or something, or there's been a bullying in a marriage, or there's been some just whatever experience, work or something. Um, that's the source. Then this is the interpretation. Right. And you're and holding up a. You're holding up now. You're holding up a dead, uh, yes. damaged tree for for people. And, and by the way, I just want to remind people: you can watch this on YouTube, and you'll get to see all the props that are being used. I don't want to interrupt you for too long, but I just want to alert people to that. Uh, keep going, Caroline. 
Thank you for that, Ian. I appreciate that. Yeah, so this is a wiry looking tree that I've actually dragged around the world with me. I got it in South Africa many years ago, but it really does the, the job because when we have a toxic experience, I mean, those things are being, you know, think of just being exposed to racism or sexism or any of the ableism, any of the ageism, all of these things. And what's, what's going on around us? That's going into us. We're building that into us. Now, our, our non-conscious mind is saying, hey, this is not good for you because this is our brain it does not have structures inside of it to handle the toxicity that this brings. These proteins are misfolded. The chemical, the chemicals flow in the incorrect way. There's imbalance. The immune system treats this in exactly the same way as it would treat something like the COVID virus or a bacterial infection or damage to your body. This is seen in the same light. It's as physical as a bacteria or a virus. Yeah. So our brain's immune system and body's immune system is responding. Our inflammation levels will increase. Our stress axis will tip over into being, instead of working for us, it will work against us. So even down to the level of our DNA, I showed that when we don't manage our mind, that our DNA, we have chromosomes. This is where the pink nails come in from our little pre pre-talk chat uh, before we started recording, but basically our chromosomes, if you hold up your fingers and make an X with your fingers, that looks like a chromosome and your nails would be what we call telomeres. And telomeres are very, very important as proxies for how we're managing our mind and our emotion, which include or how we think, feel and choose our thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. And if we, um, as we don't manage our mind, so the telomeres get shorter and shorter and weaker and weaker. And they play a massive role because when as being an alive human being, your mind is driving a process where the telomeres are dry, are the leaders in the in the process. And this process is we make in the region of eight hundred and ten thousand to a million cells every second. And those cells form every part of our body. So basically the telomeres are determining the health of your biology. And this is not an overnight thing. This is obviously over time. And it works in cycles of sixty three days basically. Um, nine week cycles and so essentially the the more we don't manage our minds and and you do a lot of work in with identity and so on and, and personality that it's so important that we actually I identify i mean and understand and manage our minds because besides all the other effects and these 1400 neurophysiological things that go wrong when we don't manage our mind we can just as quickly turn that around so i don't want this to be a scary message i want people to realize your telomeres do get short your biological age will then be affected and you can land up as i have i have one case study in this book of a subject who was around 35 at the time of the um, at the time of the clinical trial very depressed really out of it just had, had tried everything and was ready to give up and basically went into the clinical trial um, this subject's telomeres were so short that uh, the subject's biological age was 35 years 30 to 35 years older than the actual chronological age hmm. so that meant that they were sitting as a mid 30 in the mid 30s but with a body of a sickly 65 year old hmm. and i mean you think about that your vulnerability to disease has increased. And when you feel like that, your mental health is impacted. You know, it's all this feedback loop that's mm -hmm. going to happen. Within nine weeks of learning how to mind manage, I didn't give therapy. It was double blind, brain controlled and trial. Um, they, they basically got an, the app, um, the, the my neurocycle that I've developed as an app installed on their phone and they had to go work on their own. And we obviously brought them into the clinic at certain points, my research team, they never saw me or met me or anything because of the double blind nature of the trial. But essentially within nine weeks, that person's telomeres had changed to the point where their biological age now matched their actual age. And so this is like really radical research because most of the time we thought telomeres took five years to change at least. So we are seeing that the imp which and this is really good news because this means and it's hopeful because it means that because of the flexibility of our telomeres and the neuroplasticity of the brain we can edit the codes of our life we can mm -hmm. rewrite those stories and Ian I know you've got a book where you talk about your story in childhood and, and how you basically rewriting your story I mean that's literally what you're doing your story eventually and if I use this analogy here this is I don't know your whole story but I assume it wasn't the greatest of stories, the fact that you're writing about it and how you've changed and so on. But that would have been associated with not just one, but probably lots of these toxic thoughts. And as you embrace the process and reconceptualize through the, the, the whatever skills and techniques and systems and processes and work you've done, this lost energy. Because as soon as we're aware um, of our 
issues. They're coming to the conscious mind and in the brain that has an impact that's incredible. They become weaker. The protein bonds actually change. So we can change this. We designed to edit the code, which is it's fascinating. Hmm. So, if I, But if I don't edit the code, if I bring this up and I just have awareness without management, it goes back worse than before, which is what we found with our subjects in the clinical trial who didn't do mind management, which is what happens so often in life when people you know, meditate or they just suddenly get hit in the face by you know a, a memory and thoughts with all the memories and they get overwhelmed and they push it back down and eventually over time it, it takes over but as you work on that stuff as you as you instead of running from the depression and the anxiety embrace them and see them not as mental illnesses because they're not mental illnesses they're signals when you embrace them you start weakening them you start getting empowered to take control this doesn't happen overnight obviously it's in cycles of 63 days it may take you two years three years five years ten years the rest of your life but each time you do it you're getting more and more empowered so this gets less and less energy it weakens and the energy gets transferred because energy is never lost in the brain and the body or in the earth it's transferred it's always transferred from one place to the next mm -hmm. so you start transferring the energy across to building how you do want to show up so as I mentioned earlier, it, you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's in you. So as you do the work of therapy, facing your stuff, daily working on your on your mind, um, all this, you know, the things that, would, however you're doing it, through faith, through whatever it is that you're using, this is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, losing all its power, losing its energy. It's still there because we have to honor our story, but this is now what's taken over and replaced it. And this is now how you want to play, how you want your life to play out in the future. So if this was maybe a sexual abuse that's been affecting relationships dramatically and causing such excessive depression, you can't function. As you process it, this story gets weaker and weaker and you want to form a relationship. You want to be able to understand that that depression is not is more of a grieving for time lost and for innocence lost as opposed to a depression that is, I can't function. So it's a shift that happens. So I'm not saying that the depression will go away. I'm saying it will change. And in time, um, grief doesn't go away. Depression doesn't go away because these are emotions that are part of humanity. I mean, this is, this is as you know, as, a, as, an Epis, uh, as an Episcopalian priest, this is a reality. Emotions are part of what God has given us to understand how to be human. So we shouldn't try and eliminate them. We should understand them and embrace them. So classic thing, and then I'll keep quiet and ask questions because I can talk a lot about this. It's an area, <laughs> of but essentially, what we see, what we see happening, is that a person will shift. So, for example, the case study I put in this book of that, of that subject who gained thirty-five years of biological health and mental health in nine weeks in a nine-week cycle, which was sustained at six months, you know, and so on, and at, as you followed up in stages. What we see is a transition from. At the beginning, for example, when this when this uh, subject came into my trial, they told the, my research team that they are depression. So their identity was with an emotion. Mm. And it felt like that it was who they are. But you can't be depression because depression is not a being. It's not, an, it's not a noun. It's not like cancer or diabetes. It is an emotional warning signal. It's a beautiful emotion. And when I say beautiful, depression feels awful. But the beauty is in the message that it contains. And so by 20, by more or less 21 days, because I've been looking at these cycles of time of how we, how long it takes to rewire the brain and, you know, edit the code, edit the neural code. And it works in these cycles of 21 days, which aligns with how the body also heals stem cells and all that kind of stuff. And we see that within a 21 day period, more or less around three weeks, you get what we call the treatment effect. And the treatment effect is where things get worse before they get better. And that is very evident. It was evident in all my years of practice. I'm sure, Ian, you've probably seen that too. You, you get into stuff and, you know, if you've suppressed stuff for years and now suddenly you're starting to see the root, there is a grieving. So this particular subject's word summed it up beautifully. I, at the beginning, I am depression. By day 21, they said, I'm not depression but I'm even more depressed and more anxious and more sad than I was before, but it's mm. different. I'm sad and depressed and anxious because I'm grieving what this meant in my life, what mm. I've lost. Mm -hmm. what I, so that, and that's healthy because from there you can then learn to, okay, well, that is, I need to grieve that. That's very normal. And I need to allow myself periods of grief over time. I'll get more space around the grief. Think of a big jar. Think of a shot glass where you, you're stuck inside the, 
you can't move. And then think of a huge big glass jar in the, in the middle, same grief, same trauma, but you have now got space around it. So it, it's that grief. So these things don't go away and they're not meant to go away. We meant to get perspective because it's part of our story and they're part of our character. Okay, I'll stop there. That gives you a big long answer to your very good question of why do I talk about a mess and cleaning up the mental mess. As a therapist and as a priest, uh, just the sentence, you'll never understand the why is just gold, you know. So, you know, you mentioned this this new book of mine that just dropped two months ago called The Story of You. And it was really influenced by the work of Dan McAdams at Northwestern University in narrative therapy. And this, this whole idea that all of us, you know, receive and internalize messages as little people, right? Uh, and that... Um, we begin to organize our identity around a lot of those messages, right? And those experiences, because as little people, we don't have abstract thinking minds. You know, we just sort of like, this says this about me because this is what happened to me. You know what I mean? It, like, yeah, yeah. there's no capacity to interpret, right? It, it's just Maybe comes it's at you. Coping, coping right. mechanisms, yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. And so, you know, in the book, what I talk about essentially is how do we identify these arcane, broken stories uh, that we find ourselves trapped in, right? Uh, and, and, you know, it's like the old expression, you know, uh, no prison is more secure than the one you don't know you're in. I mean, we just swim with a lot of stories uh, in our experience. And of course, this is a metaphor in therapy, lots of others that we could use, other modalities that would use other languaging. But I guess, um, how is it that from in your research and in the application of your work, that people can begin to rewind these old stories? And, and I, I loved one of the things you said, I just want to highlight it, which is, maybe I guess some of it this way. It, it's like, what happened to you is not as important as what you think happened to you, right? It's like, you know, as a little person, you know, I, I grew up with a father who was a drug addict and an alcoholic. He died when I was, uh, you know, a very young man. Um, there was sexual abuse. There was physical abuse. There was emotional abuse. I mean, I picked up a lot of stuff that eventually led me to become an alcoholic and a drug addict, right? Uh, and I had to do an awful lot of work over a lot of years to kind of unwind all of this material and begin to live in a a more capacious way, a, a larger sense of self, you know, a sense of redemption and forgiveness and, you know, beginning to realize, man, this wasn't personal. <laughs> like yeah. if there had been somebody else in my shoes, they would have experienced the exact same thing. You, you know what I mean? Like it just, it's just what it was. Right. It was and, a yeah. It was a reasonable response to an adverse circumstance. Yes. It was a coping mechanism. Absolutely. So in the language of narrative therapy, I guess what I'm hearing you say is, is that we can begin to identify these stories uh, and messages and ideas that have had physiological impact on our lives um, and that um, we can release that kind of arthritic grip that we hold onto these stories. And we may not, you know, or at least to, to loosen the grip on them, begin to become aware and identify when those stories are going, mm -hmm. right? So there's that, pop, that process of self-observation, right? Yeah. Learning to self-observe, to monitor on a regular basis, and then self-regulate uh, how we act, think, and feel uh, in response to that stimuli. Is that making sense? Am I getting this right? Yes, absolutely. So, Ian, the first thing that I would do when my patients came into my practice, and they came for various reasons, like whether it was dementia, autism, learning disabilities, emotional trauma, you know, I distinguish between the neurological situations like your TBI, tumors, you know, uh, dementias versus someone who'd gone through extreme emotional trauma. But I didn't know that until they told me their story. So they would come, so, you know, obviously I'd get a, a report and that kind of thing, but I didn't read the reports until I heard the, the narrative of 
my patients. And for me, that was the most important thing and, and the, how they perceived themselves and what, and then how their story changed over time. So in my clinical trial, we did the same thing too. We looked at all the blood and the brain and the DNA and all the psychological testing. And I even have a profile, uh, even I have developed a, um, a, a scale that's been validated that looks at how you actually manage your mind. It's quite an interesting scale because it aligns with your unconscious. But the most important thing that I looked at myself and my team was the narrative and how that changed over time. So yes, absolutely. Everything you said, that whole non-conscious explanation I gave you right at the beginning, that was what you were experiencing as a child. You, you were total victim there. You didn't look for that life. You were in a life where you were absorbing your environment. The nurturing you got was not nurturing. It was abuse. And so you had one toxic event after another, one on top of another. And your, you know, your, that would have been the event um, whatever it was, the, you know, maybe your dad shouting or seeing him drunk or the physical abuse or the emotional abuse, there would have been a whole lot of them. They would have all, like a whole forest of those. And then you would have processed in your, you know, childlike brain, not knowing how to, this is this person that you're supposed to trust. It's just complete distortion. This part would have been all the misinterpretation. I'm not worthy. I'm bad. I deserve this. Or, or anger, whatever. There would have been such a lot of different things at different stages. These would have changed as time went on. But that then this would have then led to coping mechanisms that would have then been how you've manifested, how you showed up. So I don't know how you were, for example, as a child growing up, but if you were more passive or were you, whether you got aggressive or what happened, whether it changed over time. I assume it was all of the above and changed over time. And then it just, no one, you know, you, you never had a break. So, you know, you tried to cope and the pain was too much. So what do we do? We we, we try and numb the pain, the addictions, the you know the things you get into. That's not diseases. That is just terrible pain that you are experiencing as a human. It's it's inhuman what you experience. It's just can't process this. So I've got to get away from it. And so an addiction is a relationship, and it's a relationship between between yourself and a substance, and this pain, and it's a way of coping and but it's not sustainable. And then you reach a point in your life, which you obviously did, where you realize this is, I don't like what I'm, this is not working for me because this way is not playing out into a future that I like. And so you did massive work to then recognize the signals one after another and take you four categories of signals, but with different, different signals for each different thought pattern. And you had to, you pretty much deconstructed, you did a whole bunch of reverse engineering and landed up with a whole lot of these because you are now an Episcopalian priest, you are um, write books, you reach out to people, you help people, you've totally reconceptualized your pain into what our original design is, which is one of love, mm -hmm. survival. You know, so you've transformed, you've taken advantage of all the powers of neuroplasticity that we have, which is the ability to, doesn't make what you went through right. And your story has to be honored. So it's really good that you write about your story when people have been through things, if they can get, if that's not everyone will want to, but if you can write about it, speak about it when you're ready, that's huge. You know, there's a lot of trauma therapy saying, you've got to talk about the trauma now. I'm sure you'll agree with me that you cannot force someone to talk yeah. about trauma when they're not ready. It'll make it actually worse. And especially at the point of trauma, if you reinforce it by forcing people to speak about it, you actually make it worse than more difficult for the person. So it's really important that we we talk about our stories when we're ready to who yeah. we are prepared to tell the story to. So that's pretty much what you've done. And now each time I'm sure as you were writing, it was very cathartic, it was very healing to to write. And so you've been editing your code. You've pretty much edit it's been editing your code. Wow. You know, I guess maybe my son, and I see the, the, the parallel here, you know, I would say editing the narrative, which might be the same as in more scientific language, editing the code, right? It's, you know, for me, it, I would also say that, and I, people don't like to hear this, but it's just the truth. The grief process was a long one. It was yeah. a hard one. Um, it was, oof. Uh, it's very hard to explain to people um, uh, how difficult it is to extricate yourself to. And, and the, the word I often use is it, it was like uh, the process. I felt like I was being defrosted. You, you know what I mean? Like I felt good analogy. Yeah. You know, like I, like my whole love, this frozen, all this frozen material that was so hard to carry. And you know how it is, you know, if you have cold hands, you put them under hot water, it hurts like hell. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know? And then eventually your hands come back. <laughs> yeah, eventually. 
uh, that's the hope. And I feel like as a therapist, as you accompany people, it's like you need a community, you know, to walk that's with true. you. Yeah. Uh, and that's what 12 step communities are for me. You know, it's like, you know, to have fellow travelers uh, to accompany you in the in the process, you know, toward editing the code. Now, that support is, is essential because, you know, it's not just about what worries me. It's not just about you. It's about you in the environment. And that's an actual statement made by a, a leading quantum theorist that it's not about you. It's about you in the world. And it, it's so true because your environment does impact you. So when we spend years in the biomedical model and um, years and thousands and millions and millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars looking for the reason for your pain inside your brain, We'll see the impact because your mind, obviously everything you go through shows up in your brain, but that's not the cause. The cause is the environment. So we've got to always consider mm. the environment. So your narrative came from your environment and it wired in and you had to damage. So you had to, you couldn't change your story, but you could change how it plays out inside you. So now you have a new story. So the previous story, when I say you couldn't change your story, you couldn't change what happened to you, the past, but you've now transformed what you want into the future. So the changing of the story comes there, the reconceptualization of the story. Yeah. Yeah, so, I would say I, I learned to not over identify who I am with what happened to me. And you know? so, yeah, those um, you'll become a bitter victim. And it's not saying you were a victim, but you'll become a very bitter victim because you mm. have to turn that victim. And no one, you know, who can say, I can't, I wasn't in your shoes. So I don't have the right to ever think I can understand your experience. And no one has the right to try and understand anyone else's experience. All I can say is that my, I, my heart goes out to you and that your story needs to be honored as does every person's story. I'm sure everyone listening now can tell us, many people can tell us very tragic stories. Mm. But as you say, you don't want to identify with the story forever because that's what keeps you stuck. The law of entanglement in quantum physics shows such a beautiful principle. And that is that as soon as two things are in relationship, no matter what one does, the other one is going to turn. So if one particle turns this way, this other particle is going to turn that way. In terms of human relationship, the abuser is is always going to be connected, and bitterness and and victimhood keeps us uh, that that literally keeps us connected to the pain. So it's like plugging in your computer and keeping it constantly charged. Um, that's what when we when we when we identify totally with this, but when we recognize and don't see that that's not our identity, that's what's happened to us, and this is not right. We don't mm -hmm. take away all that. That's it's not right. It's wrong. That's all valid, and and the anger and the frustration and the even hatred for a season and all these things are part of it. But then there has to come a day where you can start releasing. Otherwise, yes. you stay plugged in. And yes. if you stay plugged in, this thing never loses its energy. And it's mm -hmm. always controlling you versus yes. unplugging. And then it becomes really weak and you now, you now dominate. Mm. You know, it's, uh, I remember years ago, and then I, I want to move on to this five-step process before we, we, we get out uh, with each other. But I, I do remember that... Um, Years ago, I was uh, doing a speaking engagement and uh, I was on a panel at the end of it. And uh, one of the people in the audience uh, said, well, you know, the old hackneyed question, um, what would your, you know, at that time, 55 year old self tell your 21 year old self? You know, what would you like to say to that person? And I don't know where this, you know, when sometimes something just comes out of you and you're like, I, it, I have no idea where that came from. It just yeah. came out of my mouth before I could even like process it. It just blew out of my body. I just, I looked at them and I said, I would tell my 21 year old self, you are not what you survived. Oh, wow. And then I that's burst, and then I burst into tears. Oh, that's amazing. I don't even know where it came from. <laughs> it came from. I know it came from the non-conscious mind, from that inner wisdom that you that that is basically driving you. That you, you it's ninety-nine percent of who you are, and we're not. We've got to really tune into that, and so that triggered that question, triggered that wisdom that was inside of you all the time. The mm. truth about you. Mm. So, that inner you know, wisdom. It's interesting. You we were talking about spirituality earlier, and I know I got this kooky way of seeing the world i always tell people i'm a buddhist enriched christian or i say i'm a i sometimes say a buddhish christian you know <laughs> uh because I, there are so many practices in the buddhist tradition that i've integrated into my own life as a person who uh, identifies as a christian and there's just so much brilliant uh, you've read all the science in buddhism i've read all that material um yeah. 
from a medical scientific perspective. And, and I just think there's this beautiful marriage that can be found course, I uh, agree. Uh, in the two of them. And, um, you know, I think um, that uh, one of the things that uh, I had to learn along life's way um, was to begin to uh, identify, as you, you mentioned earlier, when afflictive emotions, right, afflictive thoughts arose, um, I just was able to live in a completely different relationship with them now. Y you know what I mean? Like I can, with a very compassionate gaze. Yes, there's a different, there, there's a different relationship. Instead of it being that driving you. Holding the dead tree. So I'm holding up the, I'm holding up the toxic, the healthy tree on top of the toxic tree because it's now dominating it. And the toxic tree, mm -hmm. I don't have a small one here. It's in my other office, but I have a teeny one because that's what it shrinks to. It shrinks to just a teeny little version. Yeah. Yes. But you, the, the, the big green one gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go through right. life, get more perspective and space and so on. Mm. I, I oftentimes call it to, to direct the compassionate gaze of the mother as it looks at the infant to use the same soft gaze and visage to to observe these afflictive thoughts and emotions and not like you know you know and you know don't in such a way that you decouple from them you know you're you know that isn't me eh, that's just information running through my mind and it's and I also understand that this is where the Christian side comes in about redemption and forgiveness and reconciliation, which then again marries with this material so beautifully, right? It's like, I don't know, it's been so healing for me. And I, I'm so excited about all that you're saying because it's, it's validating things I've always believed. It's you're, you're, you're giving language to things that you, you're saying clearly what I always thought vaguely. <laughs> Good. I'm so pleased to get it. All I think is giving the science behind and the and the systems behind what we all know instinctively. Yeah. It's really all I'm you know, it's, it's truth and it should be so it's truth in another language of science. So can you quickly because we I know you've got to go and I, I wanna, you know, just honor your time. Can, is it possible to, to very quickly talk about the five step program that can can help people? experience relief from anxiety depression and you know afflictive thoughts and emotions like what is that process okay absolutely so um if i may just quickly contextualize it very quickly then mm -hmm. i'll quickly explain the five steps essentially this is a it's a 38 years of research a five step sounds so simple but each step has been very systematically studied to see how does the mind get information into the brain in the form of these trees and the impact in the body and so on. So, and how can you then deconstruct and reverse engineer that process? Um, it's, we've always got to start with, um, with preparing the brain because the brain and the body are going to just follow the pattern of the mind. So if the mind is very messy, the brain and body become very messy, then that's going to drop oxygen levels at the front of the brain and blood flow and create chaos and you can't make good decisions. So ultimately what I wanted to do was to, to understand how could I calm down someone's neurophysiology to the point where they could actually focus. And then at that point, how could I get them to tap into that deep intuitive non-conscious mind, that wise mind that's working so hard to keep us going. So that's our spiritual nature. I mean, if you want to go in, into the Christianity side of things, it really is our deep made in God's image, deep spiritual wise mind. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, all the, the religions have a version of this kind of languaging. So that deep, so basically this system is working on enabling you to use your conscious mind to connect with the deep non-conscious mind. And that's why it's so systematic because your brain, the neuroplasticity of your brain and the whole way that your body, the pretty much the plasticity of your body is very, it's very mathematical, as I mentioned already, it's very quantifiable, it's very systematic, it's very organized. There's quite everything, the, the, there are billions of calculations happening as you're speaking, as I'm speaking and as you're listening, in your happening inside your brain and your body just to get you functioning. So I wanted to take advantage of what I know to be a very quantum energetic quantifiable kind of nature and then simplify that to the point where a three-year-old could apply this because my youngest patient was a three-year-old when I was working, mm -hmm. still practicing. And my oldest was an, an 80, 
84 year old pilot who wanted to go back to school to change career because he couldn't fly anymore because his eyes weren't good enough and went back and studied to become a chartered accountant and sort of in practice till he was 98 i think 98 mm. or 99 so it's a lovely story um using the system so the system was not just to detox the brain the system is also to build the brain because one of the biggest and most unspoken parts of mental health is the resilience factor and i know that it's spoken about but not enough we are way more resilient than what we um expect and as we know we um, it's very good to be trauma informed which we you know, it's very much spoken about all over the place at the moment but we've also got to be careful that we don't create expectations in people that um that people just expect okay something bad happened that's it for the rest of my life you know you and i both are working very hard to help people realize this does not have to be the story for the rest of your life you're going to be changed but you can be changed and transformed for the, for the better and um so the all of those principles i try to incorporate and it's been a challenge to do that um so essentially what you want to do is you want to calm down your neurophysiology then you want to destabilize the neural network and the way that you destabilize a neural network is to basically bring it into conscious awareness so we all know you if you don't know what you're working on and you don't stop paying attention to it, uh, becoming aware which includes focus paying attention you know it's a whole there's a whole this sort of seven step process i won't go into all the details that that brings it into awareness but awareness so the first step then is um get once you've done the brain preparation and I give you a bunch of exercises in the book and I have an app and if you're aware I also have an app that takes you through the process and this is all based on years of clinical therapy and so on and everything I say is evidence based researched every word and I'm constantly doing research to update it um so the first thing is to destabilize is to become aware so we how do we become aware through looking at our signals our signals are how we show up and that is through your emotions how are you showing up to the signal of emotions emotions and emotions as i mentioned what are you doing saying and doing behaviors third one how does your body feel because the memories in your body too and our gut for example is one of the first places to respond because our gut has as many neurons as the spine and is directly linked to thoughts building in the brain and then the, other, the rest of the body follows a little bit after that it's all very fast though the fourth is the is our perspective at the first three channel into so emotions behaviors and bodily perspective channel into our bodily feelings will channel into our perspective once you start looking at those the big picture they will then pull up an attached thought to an unconscious mind immediately as soon as you do that will send through the subconscious from the unconscious through the subconscious it operates the unconscious operates at about 400 billion actions per second on the most profound deep level it then has a shallow level that operates at about a million operations per second which is fast we experience these 40 times a second they move into the conscious mind but we experience that as a conscious burst of, of um consciousness every 10 seconds so in english what that means is like when you watch an animated movie you are watching Mickey Mouse throwing his arms around for example I, i have a whole analogy of this on tiktok and my instagram reels with visuals of what i'm describing now people want to go and have a look it's really simple 60 second little explanation of everything i'm saying with images and so the what the unconscious mind does is it drags as soon as you become aware gather awareness you've calmed down your neurophysiology you allow the unconscious to now go and find this that's attached to that because it's very intelligent so it'll find that and will bring it into your conscious awareness and that then destabilizes this protein bond start weakening and now we can start doing the neuroplasticity side of things which is then to start looking at in my interpretation what is this attached to so first of all the signals will tell me okay this is a thought about um i don't believe i can form a relationship and um then you start looking deeper and you start saying okay the branches what are how what am i thinking feeling and choosing about myself so take the four signals and you literally add sense put them into full sentences by leading by saying okay i i'm feeling depressed why am i feeling depressed what is it saying about me what are the emotions so i'm just giving you a very quick overview but that work starts um activating two sides of the two sides of the brain it starts increasing intuition it changes your the the, the you increase gamma wave i mean it is just your you have a downstream effect in your hpa axis you drop homocysteine levels you increase it's just unbelievable what's happening in the brain in response the second step is then to go into deep reflection when you shine a light through a prism a white light through a prism it's a single light and it comes out as a rainbow on the other side that's what reflection is you're taking that the signals to the thought to the what am i how do i see myself down to the now why 
So you're trying to find, so you, you know, you put the light into the prism, now you're trying to find why. So it's the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. And then you're going to process, that takes you down even deeper. And you're going to start, get, you get to the third step, which is third and fourth step are both writing steps. The third step is where you pour your thoughts on paper in the form of what I call a metacog, which kind of looks like this. It's messy and it's supposed to be because it forces the two sides of the brain to work together. Phenomenally powerful in getting into the non-conscious, finding the thought, finding the associated thoughts, putting them up putting all the categories and associations and things that you won't even believe that you were ever thinking of. And then from there, you go to the fourth step, which is also a right step, where you now start trying to make sense of this. And this, and making sense is, what are the triggers? What are the patterns? What are the antidotes? This is what's happened. What can I do? And then you end the cycle with an active reach, which is an action that closes the work for the day, because you shouldn't do this for more than 15 to 45 minutes in a day. And then you stop. So it's a few minutes per each step. You've got to be very disciplined to move through it. Otherwise, you'll wipe out your brain and you'll be exhausted and you'll exhaust yourself on a conscious level and it will impact you negatively for the rest of the day. So you need to be very disciplined when you're doing the heavy work of dealing with traumas and so on. Um, and then the active reach is a statement that summarizes the work. It's a positive statement. It could be a quote. It could be a scripture. It could be a statement like, I'm not depression. I'm depressed because of something. And that's mm -hmm. okay. It's something as simple as that. Then through the day, and in the app, you can actually set an active reach reminder. So it goes off seven times during the day, which is the minimum amount of time you want to prompt your conscious mind to stay disciplined in the conscious moment of whatever you're doing and not get dragged back into this intrusive thought. Because this will take over 95% or 96% of your day if you allow it. So you don't. You train yourself. So you're taking energy away and you're putting it into where you want to go towards. And then you would repeat this process daily for 21 days, 15 to 45 minutes. Thereafter, you would have pretty much deconstructed most of this, depending on how big of a deal we're dealing with. Sometimes it's it's enough just to do one cycle. Sometimes it just starts the process, depending on what you're dealing with. Then the next 42 days are absolutely critical because if you don't do them, this has not yet had enough energy taken from it. And this is only a little branch. It's not the whole bush yet. Mm. So we need this to get weaker and we need this to get bigger and that requires using the five steps for an additional at least 42 days and it's only five minutes mm. and really quick and but that is what transforms um carryover because carryover is a huge problem in therapy which you i'm sure will have picked up um and it's a part of some something i've done research on over the years as well and also it's sustaining and maintaining we shouldn't have to be in therapy for years and years and years constantly we should be able to um, and i'm not condemning anyone it's nothing no problem going back and forth but you need to have these cycles where you get something under to manage something let's take the word control out and let's talk about manage and then move on to the next thing and the next thing so also you can't be with your therapist 24 7 or your co counselor or coach, you you wake up with yourself at night. You you go with yourself to, you know, you're going to, to the work with yourself. You're sitting at dinner with yourself. You have to know how to manage your own mind. So the more you do this, the more it carries over into your life and into your day. So you can also use the neurocycle as a, as a life hack, literally. And I give examples in the book and in the app where let's say you're about to go into a meeting, you have an argument with someone, it throws you completely, and you, yet you have to be totally focused for this meeting, you can quickly go through a neuro cycle in a minute or under to get yourself back in order again. And so it becomes, the more you do it, the more you're learning to manage your mind and direct your neuroplasticity. So mm. that's the principle of brain. Wow. All right, everybody. I am speaking to, I hope, my new friend, Dr. Caroline Leaf. I'm sp speaking to her about... So many incredible things. She's the author of Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, Five Simple Scientifically Proven Steps to Reduce Anxiety, Stress, and Toxic Thinking. She also has developed this app, NeuroCycle, N-E-U-R-O, Cycle. And uh, she's holding up the card right there with the spelling. And you could just go over to wherever you get apps, you know, onto the Apple Store and, and, and download NeuroCycle. I cannot commend the book enough. Uh, there's, she has, you can go to her website, drcarolineleaf.com. Am I correct? Is that what it is? I believe it is. Just, just, just drleaf.com. Oh, website, thank you. No, no problem. And then my Instagram handles are Dr. Caroline Leaf. So Dr. Okay. Caroline Leaf for those and Dr. Leaf for the website. Right. And I'm also on TikTok now as well. So 
Wonderful. Okay. Well, listen, Dr. Leaf, what a pleasure. I mean, what an education. What And what I leave with today, Anthony, is, uh, you know, I guess this profound sense of awe about the human person, right? The complexity, the mystery, the beauty, the you know, all, all of that. And then, but also a sense of hopefulness, you know, and I, I do, I am, despite uh, many experiences, I would say that I'm a very hopeful person. You know, I, I believe in um, the, the fundamental beauty of every human being, the original goodness that is found. And, and Thomas, Thomas Merton talks about the immortal diamond, the diamond at the center of every human person that is untouched by trauma and sin or snake, whatever you call it. There is this yeah. core beauty that has never been wounded. Uh, now, there's a lot of material around it. You know, it's, it's been obscured, right? It's been, you know, it may be, may be veiled, but we can move closer and closer to reclaiming um, that that original beauty and goodness uh, it, it's, that is there for us. So, Dr. Lee, thank you so much. I used to read the I just downloaded it. I can't wait to start. Oh, <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's been, a, it's been an honor and I've loved our conversation. And, and yes, definitely, uh, let's connect again. And, Thank you for asking such a beautiful, deep questions and allowing me to really talk about this stuff. So thank you. Our pleasure. Thank Be you. well. Thank, uh, you for you. thank you for what you do. Now, listen, everybody, Typology Tribe, may you have love, may you have joy, may you have peace, and may you have healing, and may you have rest. Until next time.